This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043. Welcome back, Jonathan Clark. We're in the studio with Tom Stephen, his new book, Best Seat in the House, My Life in the Jeff Healy Band. It's available now on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and wherever you buy books. And Tom, of course, the former manager and drummer in the Jeff Healy Band for 15 years or so. Tom, you you and I have known each other for uh, quite a long time. Uh, in fact, we worked together when you were in the Jeff Healy Band. Um, I just want to review for those that do not know about Jeff Healy, you guys put out five studio albums, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, he was an incredible guitar player. He became blind at the age of one from a rare form of cancer. Uh, he had this unorthodox way of playing the guitar, sort of like as if you put the guitar on your lap and fretted it like it was a piano. But man, the the Hendrix-like lightning bolts that will come out of that guitar were absolutely amazing. I'm going to read some quotes really quick from the back of the book. Um, this one from Stevie Ray Vaughan. Jeff has revolutionized the way guitar is played. B.B. King, you've got a guy named Jeff Healy. There's none better than him. Pass the word on him. I love that guy. George Harrison, an amazing guitarist. Slash, he was a true phenomenon. And Brian Adams, wherever you are, Jeff, we remember rocking with you. So, Welcome, Tom. Uh, it's good to see you again and really happy that you put this book out. We lost Jeff in 2008. This book is sort of like your memoir, but it's also the history of you with Jeff and sort of the history of Jeff too, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the idea is um, I wanted people to, before we lost Jeff to history, the idea was to uh, help people to understand that history, where we came from, what Jeff was about, my interaction with him. Uh, basically, three nerds who got together and <laughs> beat all the odds. Yeah. And, uh, as one of the uh, folks once wrote about us, uh, literally the blind leading the blind. So there it was. Um, and that's so true. And do I have this right? Jeff was actually sort of, you know, I don't know if discovered is the right word, but he was he was brought to public attention by Stevie Ray Vaughan and Albert Collins? That's correct. There, How did that happen? There was a, a room in Toronto called Al Albert's Hall, no longer there. But at the time, um, Jeff was sort of like a 17-year-old kid, and everyone was starting to go, hey, man, who is this guy? And he was getting into clubs underage and whatnot. And uh, he had a friend, Corey, who I just cannot recall his last name, but somehow Corey had persuaded Albert Collins to bring him up on stage. Albert was playing at Albert's Hall in the upstairs room. And uh, Albert was kind of, eh, one of these things, but, you know, we'll let the kid come up and sit in for one track. And, of course, once Jeff sat in for one track, it was the whole night. And by fluke, uh, Stevie Ray happened to be in town. And Albert and Stevie were good pals. And it was like, hey, Stevie, man, you got to come down and check this kid out. It was one of those things. And uh, Stevie literally came down, and that night they just, the three of them just ripped up the place. And my favorite picture in the book actually is uh, Albert with his arm around Stevie Ray, and they're both just looking at Jeff with oh, a big man. smile on their face. Unbelievable. And, and that, I mean, you just, you know, that, that's, that's being anointed by the best and the greatest. It's so fantastic. How did it come about that you ended up in a band with Jeff and uh, Joe? It, it, it's a weird one. I was playing with this guy called Buzz Upshaw, and... Uh, Buzz wasn't the most motivated guy. He had a, he had a job. His gig was a, a garbage truck driver. And <laughs> big, big, huge guy with one foot shorter than the other. Wonderful guy. But he used to fall asleep a lot at the wheel of the car. And <laughs> we actually literally hit our agent one night, and that kind of slowed things down a little bit. But Jeff was a big fan of Buzz's, and he used to come out and see the band play. And as a consequence of that, eventually he kind of said, hey, man, I, you know, it'd be great if you come and sit in at Grossman's with me. Yeah, I like how you play drums and be cool to jam. And I asked Buzz if that if that was cool, and Buzz was like, "Yeah, you know, he's, he seems like a nice kid." Now here's the embarrassing part: I'd met Jeff a couple times, and, and I I sort of had a feeling maybe he had some issues in terms of getting around. But it wasn't until that night at Grossman's he leapt out of his chair because he played on his lap. But Jeff, what people didn't realize, he didn't just sit there and play in his lap. He could jump out of a chair literally hold this guitar against his thighs. He jumped all over the room, somehow got on a chair, on a table, knocked everything over, <laughs> made it back to the chair, sat down, good night, don't drink and drive, I know I don't, and then went to the back of this little room. I was like, what the heck just happened, man? It blew my mind. So I went back and we're sitting down, and the only thing he said, look, I'd like you to 
be in my band. And I said, well, I'd like to start a band with you. That'd be cool. But, you know, I'm just finishing a degree and I'm kind of taking life seriously. We got to have a plan. And by the way, man, like you're drinking a fair bit by the looks of things there. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, man, you're knocking everything over. He goes, Tom, I'm blind. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. Bada boom. Yeah, oh, yeah. right. <laughs> so, um, and, and the rest, uh, well, so you started playing, and then somehow you guys got a record deal or something? or Not quite that easy, but uh, we, we were looking for a bass player. And Jeff would go through bass players, like, you know, we're blasting through them a couple, you know, every month, till eventually I met Joe on another gig, and uh, we sat in one night again at Grossman's, and uh, that night was when the band was created. We shook hands and said, let's do it, you know. Now, this overnight success thing, uh-uh, not quite. What did start happening, though, is uh, we managed to get a gig at Expo. And uh, another long story, but managed to get on stage with B.B. King. And once B.B. and Jeff set in at Expo, boom. That was in all the entertainment papers, not only in, in Canada, but a, across uh, North America. And uh, from there, our ratings went up in terms of clubs. Now we're making money, and we're saving money because we were actually a band that put money in the bank. Because what we realized, we were meeting girls and alcohol and anything else for free. So it's like, you know. <laughs> I'm shocked. Yeah, shocked to shocking, hear this. Shocked. Well, you hung out with us. So <laughs> yeah. you, um, and, and it was it, like we were running it like a business. And what was happening, and not to, you know, take any way, anything away from, you know, Canada. I'm a proud Canadian, as was Jeff and Joe. Um, no one was buying it. And one guy actually told me it with a major label, he said, you know, like, I don't really know what the gimmick is here, but I don't want it to be like a circus act. And he said, man, this isn't about who's blind or not blind. It's about how great this guy is. I mean, Stevie thinks he's great. B.B. King thinks he's great. No one was buying into it. Um, the boys gave me enough money to come to New York. They trusted me and went around. And eventually, uh, your old label. Now, there's a bit of a confusion because I've spoken to Mitchell since. I thought I'd given the material directly to Mitchell, but he got it. Maybe from Sean, one of the radio guys at at, at Arista. Anyway, at yeah. Arista. Anyway, somehow that from me via NBC, they got that material. Mitchell gave me a ring, came up, saw the band, um, flew us down literally within weeks, and I think we were signed to you guys within a couple of months. Unbelievable. It, yep, overnight success, four yeah. years later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, fast forward, um, uh, you and the band were in the cult classic film Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. That's just one of many stories in the book. Uh, there are so many good ones. There's one I want to touch on briefly, uh, and that's uh, Jeff's version of How My Guitar Gently Weeps um, with George Harrison and Jeff Lynn, I believe. Tell that story. How did that happen? Um, I, I, had, I had mentioned to Mitchell, Roy Lott, and Clive, uh, Clive Davis um, – Arista folks. Yeah, uh, kind of. Wouldn't it be great? Because we were doing that song a lot, and it and it was working really well. And we decided let's put it out, or at least put it on our on. I can't remember which album now. Uh, yeah, it'll come to mind in a moment. That was the third album, I believe. Uh, third album. Yeah. Let, let's let's do that track. It's a great track. And it was almost tongue in cheek. I said it'd be great if we could get George Harrison on it. And uh, it was kind of like, yeah, right, whatever kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, a Beatle, you know, sure, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't call us, we won't call you. And, uh, <laughs> kind of. But uh, we, we were recording at uh, Le Studio uh, in Morin Heights, which is just outside of Montreal. And uh, every, not every night, but every couple of nights, like the house, the studio was two miles from the house. To tell you how bad the weather was and how much snow there was, when we got there, we had to buy a Jeep because you couldn't get around without one. And... Uh, We'd all be recording, and if I get back to that house a little earlier, Jeff would phone me and go, well, Tom, George Harrison here, um, I would love to be on your record. And it was that kind of nonsense. Just pulling your leg, yeah. Always. It was, it was a running joke. And then one night the phone rings, and it's George Harrison here. And I, I literally, yeah, right, Jeff, and cl click, hung up, phone rings back. George Harrison. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, my God, it's George Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of like that. And uh he said, look, I, I can't, he said, first, I'm a huge fan of Jeff and the band, and I, I can't be, um, you know, can't come there to record, but I'm going to be going through Los Angeles. I'm doing a little session there, and uh, if you wouldn't mind, perhaps we could have Jeff Lynn sit in on the record. I'm like, I mean, I'm jumping up and down. This is amazing, and that's pretty much what happened. And we were literally on our, I think, second or third last day of recording, and they did the slaves out there and got them up to Canada, and that's how the record was put together. Oh man, yeah, so yeah. good. 
Uh, and g- going back to uh, Jeff being blind, he, him, like Stevie Wonder, he would play pranks on people uh, because of his blindness, um, made even more devious by, you know, the fact that he was blind. And then, like, poker games, for example. <laughs> like, he would win at poker. Like, how was that possible? That's what I kept asking quite quite a bit because all of a sudden you're a few thousand dollars down and you're thinking, man, I'm getting my ass kicked by this blind dude. We all are. Everyone was. There's there's two stories. I catch him one time and I realize they're Braille cards and he was bending the uh, bending the corners. Now, I'm not a great card player to start with, but it was, hey, I think he's playing me here. So I could see the window, see his card. So now I'm starting to win. He goes, Stephen, I know you're cheating. I just can't figure out what it is. I said, well, that's okay, Healy, because I figured out how you've been cheating. And that was a, <laughs> a pretty good laugh. So go ahead about a year, and we ended up on a cross-country train that much music in Canada put together, which is really a proud Canadian thing to do because yes. it went from Halifax to the West Coast of started Canada. started a long time ago with, like, the Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin and, and, you know. It was a reenactment of that vibe, Canadian talent with guest talent from all around the world. And Jeff, of course, starts beating everyone in cards on the train. And uh, what I find out later is the Much Music guys are a lot smarter than me, apparently, because they figured out, like, almost day one. So they started putting those little GoPro-type cameras behind Jeff's cards. And that's so that was always a running gag. You know? Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jeff did, had a sense of humor. Did, uh, did Jeff actually drive a tour bus at a- one point? Absolutely. Um, uh <laughs> Hard as that may be to believe. And he was drunk. <laughs> so um, we had just been in England, and I literally fell out of my bunk because the bus is shimmering all over the road. And we're on, I think, Interstate 95, on our way to Boston, I believe. Uh, must have been 95, yeah. yeah. It, it is wintertime, and I'm thinking, man, this driver's like going to kill us. What's going on? Fell out of my bunk. I'm walking, trying to walk to the front of the bus, and I'm seeing the bus driver on the right-hand side of the bus, and I'm hung over enough thinking, are we still in England? Because the driver's on the right, not not the left. And as I'm getting closer, I'm hearing, that's right, Jeff, just a little to the left, no one over there, just a little to the right, the guy was from Texas. And I'm like, Jeff. And then I realized Jeff's driving the bus. But Jeff was that guy, man, if he wanted to do something, whether it was on stage, off stage, that's what I loved about the guy. I mean, Unbelievable. He, he, he went for it. My, uh, we're talking with Tom Steven, uh, former drummer and manager of the Jeff Healy Band. His new book, Best Seat in the House, My Life in the Jeff Healy Band. It's available now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you buy books. Uh, there are so many great stories in this book. Um, jamming on stage with Eric Clapton, Lenny Kravitz, Stevie Ray Vaughan, of course. Was there, was there, a, a, there was a famous bowling game with ZZ Top? Again, Jeff, who's blind, is bowling was easy top. I, I, for, for the sake of disclaimer, at the beginning of the book, I, I do state some of this is a little hazy, but um, the co-writer, uh, Keith, who, who you met, Keith yes. Greenberg, m- my, my understanding with Keith was, you know, interview who and what you want and whatever you think should be in the book is fine. Like I had no buy or whatever. How it is is how it is. The real deal. And uh, somewhere along the line, he came up with this with with this story, and I I had mentioned it, but I was never quite clear. But apparently, yes, we went bowling with ZZ Top, and on top of that, Jeff got a strike, to, <laughs> to the point that these guys are going, "This guy's not blind. Wait, like, what kind of gimmick you guys right run, yeah run, running here?" But yeah, he apparently got himself a strike. I mean, it's all a little hazy, and uh, but Billy Gibbons loved Jeff and just treated him really really well. And, and there were several pranks on that tour that were. Were pretty cool, including uh, something about hitting a f- uh, fountain with a car. But I'm, that's a little. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, there was also a point that you were summoned to the White House by none other than uh, President Clinton. True, um, we had met uh, um, President Clinton when he was Governor Clinton, and it, it, he jokingly had said, "You know, one day I'll have you all over to to the White House," kind of thing. And we were in. Uh, Washington for Ronnie Hawkins' uh, birthday. Ronnie's being a famous yes. rock and roller, uh, but made his home in Canada, but an Arkansas native and, and a friend of uh, of the Prez. And uh, it was Ronnie's birthday, and the president was supposed to come and jam and play sax at the uh, at club. the club, or at the actually at the Canadian Embassy. And uh, that doesn't happen. Next thing, literally like in TV, little things in their ears and glasses. Guys ask me. We had uh, social security numbers and suits and ties. And I'm like, no, we don't have suits and ties. And 
for you guys. And <laughs> and nothing said. You just get your passport, show the stuff, grab Jeff. We get in a limo, and there's Ronnie. And I go, Ronnie, what's going on? He goes, just, you know. Roll, roll with, with it. it, yeah. Hey, roll with it, exactly. Hey, we nailed it. Roll with it. Right? <laughs> and that was it. Next thing, we're going into the White House, and we're told we'll have uh, five five minutes in the Oval Office. And then we go with Ronnie and uh, Ronnie's lady and myself and Jeff, and there's the president. And Ronnie proceeds to tell what I consider to be not the kind of joke that would in the Oval be Office. told in the uh, Oval Hosp- Office. And it was a good, oh, that's a good one, Ronnie. Have you heard this one? And it, it went downhill from there. And five minutes went into 45 minutes, and it was a real honor and a lot of fun. Unbelievable. Yeah, great guy. Um, uh, also, some uh, laughs. Uh, I'd I, I like to point out, though, when he found out we were from Canada, they kicked us out. <laughs> <laughs> no uh, votes. Also, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you guys can't vote. Um, also, encounters with Keith Richards and Bob Dylan. Is there a documentary in the works for yes. this for this book? Uh, there is. Uh, it's been in the works for years, but it's finally um, finally got some life, and it's real, and uh, we just started uh, going into pre- pre- pre-production as we speak. I mean, to be candid, there's there's certain folks out there who aren't necessarily sure I should be telling this story or not telling the story, and I had some personal issues in my life where it was kind of like, you know, I've sat in the sideline for many years. Um, this is a chapter in, in, in music history, both Canadian and worldwide, that I think the story has to be told correctly and I was there for it and as I say we're open to everyone is, who's involved in the story but my concern was um, I, I spent a lot of time going back and forth from Canada to the States and what I was starting to see was in the States people remember Jeff but in our own country it was started it wasn't as people got a little younger there was less under you know, understanding who he was and I ran into a, a Canadian artist called Tom Cochran. Um, that might ring a bell. Life is a Highway was a great, great Lunatic song. Fringe, too, yeah. Right, right. And, and all the great hockey, like our unofficial hockey anthems. And uh, several months ago, and I didn't know it was a private party. I didn't know Tom was playing. It was a friend of mine's private party. We go in, and there's Tom playing this set. And the third song in, he starts talking about the late, great Jeff Healy. And he ends uh, his little tribute by saying why the f f you know isn't jeff Lee in the hall of fame and he sees me when he's leaving the stage and he grabs me and we go we go to this reception and have a couple of drinks we had a long hard talk about music and canada and why jeff needs to be remembered and that's really for me it was like you know what if a guy like tom is telling me that i'm doing it yeah <coughs> excuse, excuse me pardon me and um that's pretty much when, when the decision was made to move forward. Right. Well, and, we're, we're, and I want to point out, Tom also gave us our first big national tour in Canada. And later we managed a young lady called Amanda Marshall, who was a fairly substantial artist in Canada and had uh, some hits in the States. And Tom gave her that tour. So Tom is kind of like uh, the soul in some way of, of, our, of, of who, how we got our start. So he really means a lot to me. Well, I will never forget Jeff Healy Band, and anyone who's ever seen the Jeff Healy Band will never forget them either because he was just so... And for me, when I was working uh, at the record company, you know, we had some rock bands, you know, on the label, you know, we had, but it was mostly kind of like a, a pop sort of situation. And then when I found out, uh, I didn't know <laughs> who you were, but when I heard it, I didn't see any videos or anything like that, but when I heard the music, I was like, oh, man, this is so... I'm so sorry. You know, I'm a frustrated guitar player too. I was so excited to work with you guys, and it was just so much fun. And Jeff was a, a really sweet guy, like especially like in the first few albums. I mean, you guys really worked your ass off, you know, promoting things, which is, you know, getting a record deal is one thing, as you know, but from that, that's when the work starts. You know what I mean? That's when you have to go out and promote and do interviews and tour dates and no sleep and the whole thing. But, um, you guys were so great to work with. It was so much fun. Um, is this where I get to mention your contribution to uh, Rock and Roll? No, we want people to read the book. Uh, okay. Which we're going to hold up to the camera here again. Uh, Best Seat in the House, My Life in the Jeff Healy Band, written by Tom Stephen and uh, Keith Elliott Greenberg. And it's now on uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever you buy books. Uh, Indigo in Canada. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to the documentary too, man. Should be out uh, September next year. Fantastic. Tom, thank you so much. My pleasure, and thank you. Great to see you. 
This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043.